Lake Champlain, located in the northeastern part of the United States. Bordered by New York State on the west, Vermont on the east, and the province of Quebec on the north, it is the sixth largest freshwater lake in the country, 125 miles long and 15 miles at its widest point. Lake Champlain's crystal clear surface covers 500 square miles and can drop to depths of over 400 feet in some spots. Portions of the shoreline are occupied by seasonal homes, but the main residents are concentrated in several towns and cities, like Plattsburgh on the New York side and Burlington across the lake in Vermont. Lake Champlain is a go-to destination for relaxation and vacations, but there is one drawback. Some believe the lake harbors a monster. The monster of Lake Champlain has been called one of the continent's great unsolved mysteries of science. A giant prehistoric beast lurking in the depths of the lake. Hundreds of eyewitnesses over four centuries claim to have seen it. Don't know for sure what it is, uh, but something came up along the side of the boat. I don't know what I saw, but it was eerie and it was unsettling. Something caught the corner of my eye, but it definitely uh, something was there. We turned around, we were looking at it, and it was a black neck and head. This is totally, I, I, this is probably the closest rendition of anything I've ever seen that has been put together that fills the bill of what I saw. Their testimonials all describe a creature weighing several tons and measuring over 30 feet. There are three large humps protruding from this calm lake surface, motionless, and they just very slowly sunk beneath the surface of the lake. What I saw was sort of greenish brown, brownish green and um, it didn't have any features other than this sort of roundish, post-looking thing. What we saw was a black neck and head of something. These are the size of the, of the fins that came out of the water. This size, that size, four, jobbies that were purple, and this was all this paint color. Journalists, explorers, scientists, residents, and tourists, more than 300 in all, are convinced they've seen a monster in the lake. The first person to claim they'd seen it was none other than explorer Samuel de Champlain. Lake Champlain features dozens of bays and over 70 islands. According to witnesses, the lake monster has some favorite spots in this immense body of water. Bulwaga Bay, at the southern end of the lake, is where sightings occur most frequently. This small bay is only about 30 feet deep and considered an angler's paradise. With its school of brown and rainbow trout, carp and catfish, Bullwaga Bay is a hotspot for everyone hoping to lure a trophy fish. Although people claim to have spotted something monstrous lurking beneath the surface of the bay, the big one always seems to get away.
after first revealing itself to Samuel de Champlain in 1609, the mysterious creature made several later appearances in Bulwaga Bay, including one in 1887 to a group of railway workers. After that, for whatever reason, the lake monster seems to have shied away and remained hidden for over 100 years. In the 20th century, the monster finally rose to fame. In 1930, with the upgrading of Highway 22 that runs alongside the bay, an increase in travelers coming into the area led to an increase in reported sightings. That's when the creature earned its official name, Champ, and it soon became a star attraction from Port Henry to Burlington. In the 1990s, there was a flurry of Champ sightings. Uh, there several books on Champ came out, a lot of newspaper stories, some of which I was writing, and people came forward all the time with Champ sighting. Uh, this board was put in back in the 1980s. Uh, it was originally designed to be sort of an evolving board that would catalog everyone who's ever seen Champ. It was in early December. We were coming back uh, from the Lake George area along the lake shore um, below Port Henry to South Port Henry on a Sunday afternoon. And so I was looking out the window and all of a sudden I see this post-like thing. So I turn to Bob and I say, what's that post-like thing out there? And when I look back, it was gone. There was no post, but there were concentric circles of water, you know, like big round ripples <laughs> going out. And posts just don't disappear like that. <laughs> we couldn't see anything. The lake was flat, nothing was there, but it wasn't my imagination. I believe in Champ. Because Route 22 runs straight through Port Henry, the village is considered to be Champ's official residence. At first glance, Port Henry has all the traditional charm of small town America. A courthouse, a Liberty Bell, fine dining in heritage buildings, two well-attended churches. But the town also worships two local VIPs, Johnny Padres, a Major League Baseball legend, and Champ. Why should you come to Port Henry? Well, I mean, all you need to do is look at the area. It looks like a European village on a hillside. It's uh, just absolutely spectacular. And of course, we have our world famous um, resident, Champ, who, you know, uh, to this day, even myself, you know, you can't look out on the Lake Champlain without looking for something out there that may be different. The city is so attached to its monster that authorities have declared the lake a protected sanctuary for Champ. A formal public decree forbids anyone to harm, abuse, harass, or otherwise attempt to destroy it. It can be approached, observed, and even caressed, but under no circumstances can anyone hurt it. Port Henry has about 1,200 full-time residents. During the summer season, that number grows tenfold. Its two marinas are huge draws for boaters, anglers, and because of Champ, lovers of strange phenomena. But if anyone were to declare a national sport in the village of Port Henry, the search for the lake monster would be the unanimous choice, hands down. Residents with waterfront properties have a front row seat for observing their lake 
We bought our summer house from an old merchant marine who had traveled uh, the world on freighters. And one of my first days here, I'll never forget this, we were out fishing in a, in a very small boat off uh, Port Henry here. And he looked at me and he said, Ron, there are some very strange things in this lake. That sentence hung in my mind and, and really uh, mesmerized me and stayed with me from the ages of 13 to uh, my late 20s when that sentence came back into play. And I'll tell you what happened to that. In 1981, there were a flurry of champ sightings in the Port Henry area. And I was working as a newspaper reporter for the Albany and New York Times Union, which is the major daily paper in Albany, New York, the capital city. And my editors uh, were interested in seeing all these news reports about Champ being sighted just two hours north of Albany, this major lake, Lake Champlain. And uh, I wrote a six-part series chronicling the flurry of activity uh, in the Port Henry area. It was a good story. My paper played it big. Um, so at the time when I was writing the piece and when the pieces were published, I didn't care whether there was a monster in the lake or not. But two years later, almost to the day, my perspective changed dramatically. July 4th weekend, 1983. I am fishing with my girlfriend. Lake Champlain is like glass. And my girlfriend is in the front of the boat. She says, Ron, what's that? I don't pay a whole lot of attention. We're being quiet, we're fishing, trying to catch fish. She says again, Ron, what's that? And she points, and I look to where she's pointing. We watched for probably 10 seconds, three large humps that looked like large tires sticking maybe a foot, foot and a half out of the water, motionless. After seeing these three large humps out of the water, uh, looking back, I have to conclude, uh, although I haven't seen anything since, and I've been on the lake most every day in the last uh, five or six years in the summer, you have to come to the conclusion that there's something unexplained in the lake. And it could very well be, in my mind, uh, a plesiosaur could be something that uh, escapes all of our imagination and may be there yet to be discovered. People who live along the shore of Lake Champlain aren't the only ones interested in Champ. Scientists are also getting caught up in the mystery. I think he looks like a big fish, kind of like a dinosaur from prehistoric times. We are now on the other side of Lake Champlain, in the town of Burlington, Vermont. If Port Henry offers the best places to spot Champ, then Burlington qualifies as the nerve center for local marine research. The scientific body known as the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain organized a gathering to help unravel the mystery of its local monster. My name is Linda Bowden. I am the Science Education Specialist, and we have an exciting program today. It's called CHAMP, the Unsolved Mystery. Dozens of theories have been put forward about the monster. Then, in 1977, a photo appears that grabs the attention of the scientific community. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence that we have is the photograph that Sandra Mancy took in 1977. So the photograph looks a lot like what you were saying, a plesiosaur. When she first took that photograph, she wasn't certain what she saw, but it was something that was very dangerous in her mind. She needed to get the kids out of the lake. They were swimming there when this creature came up behind. That is the only photograph, the only clear photograph of Champ that's out there right now. The Mansi photograph displays the unmistakable profile of a monster. Champ appears to be a species of aquatic dinosaur known as a plesiosaurus. She 
took the photo to the New York Times, and the New York Times took it to an analyst who determined that it wasn't a fraud, it wasn't a fake, and the New York Times ran the photo. Uh, it's since been reproduced in numerous magazines, uh, newspapers, it's been in specials about Champ. Uh, the, the Mansi photo is regarded as the most definitive proof that Champ exists. Some in the scientific community needed proof the image wasn't an optical illusion before they would accept Champ as the real thing. In-depth analysis determined the photo was not a fraud and concluded the creature in the photo actually was Champ. I have seen the Mansi photograph and I've read some of the uh, various analyses of that photograph and it's a, um, a little bit of a mystery still, uh, which is part of what makes it all exciting. It shows what looks to be uh, a, a creature's head. It just looks like one of those toy dinosaurs from when I was a small child. Uh, and so if uh, you imagine the head of a brontosaurus or something like that, gosh, this would look a lot like that. When I first saw the Sandra Mansi photograph, I thought she'd taken a photo of a plesiosaur. I thought that this was absolute proof that Champ exists. Uh, the Mansi photograph was reported to be taken in the area of Missisquoi Bay, in the northern part of the lake. However, uh, in the area that uh, Sandra Mansi reported taking the photograph, the water of the lake is uh, about 14, 15 feet deep. It's not very deep. So a large creature would have a very hard time, quite a challenge hiding in that shallow depth of water. Even though Lake Champlain reaches depths of up to 410 feet, skeptical scientists believe it's highly unlikely such a massive animal could thrive here, let alone reproduce in such a restricted habitat. In order to maintain a population over a long time, there probably would need to be 40 or 50 champ-like creatures here to breed uh, and to withstand the uh, rigors of time. Uh, a very small population of uh, one couple or one pair uh, would really not be sufficient. Another argument that challenges Champ's existence concerns the chronological order in which dinosaur species became extinct. The plesiosaur hypothesis is an interesting idea. Uh, it has a lot of appeal to, to some people, and they can imagine what it might look like. Uh, however, uh, the environment here has not been very good uh, for a persistent population of plesiosaurs. Uh, for one thing, uh, the rest of the world uh, saw the extinction of the plesiosaurs about 65 million years ago. So when we talk about the history of Lake Champlain, it's 10,000 years. So we have to remember that's, that the plesiosaurs went extinct 65,000 thousand years ago. Lake Champlain was formed after the disappearance of Ice Age glaciers and the vast sea around it. This dramatic transformation of the geography in the region had a major impact. Salt water gave way to fresh water. Desalination made it highly unlikely that any sea creature could survive in such an environment. Science hasn't explained all of life's mysteries. Champ may be one of them. Let's take a look at some of the crypto or cryptids, as they're called, animals that have been out there. One of the first ones was Kraken. As you may know, the giant sea serpent, right? Now, the giant squid, as they're called, have eyes the size of dinner plates. They have a very shark beak. And it wasn't until 2006 that Japanese scientists actually got on film this giant squid. So what was a cryptid became, yes, in fact, this animal is real. And it was in water over 2,900 feet. So what do you think now about Champ? Could he be a cryptid? 
Could he be something out in the water we're not so sure? So I think we're constantly finding things that are in our seas, in our lakes, in our oceans that we didn't know were there before. And I think people are, are relating to that information saying, oh, well, if folks are discovering new things, then why cannot they discover a lake monster too? Seeing Champ, I, I just think that there are things in my worldview that I believe we don't know everything. There's room for things um, that we don't know. And so I find myself gazing out at the lake at times, if I'm reading or walking. I know people that say they don't believe in Champ and they, you can catch them looking, crossing the ferry. At one time, geologically, when the sea was connected to the lake, why wouldn't it be possible for sea creatures that we haven't, we don't know about to have come in to Lake Champlain and then adapted their existence in Lake Champlain? We don't know. And, and it's interesting not to know. Somebody said it was a duck later on. You know, like, ah, you saw a duck, don't worry about it. It looked like a post, except it certainly wasn't. My buddy was saying, hey, um, it's ducks, something swimming. Like, right, ducks. Dude, no, um, ducks don't no swim way. at night, and uh, they quack. Objects floating or moving across a lake surface can sometimes fool the eye. Because our eyes, brains, and emotional states aren't always on the same wavelength, we can't be sure that what we're seeing is actually there. Spotted from a distance, a duck or a tree trunk can have multiple interpretations. In a split second, we might think we see something that, frankly, doesn't exist. So turn around, what do you see? A rabbit. A rabbit, okay, turn back around. I'm gonna change the photo. All right, now turn, what do you see? Tell me. A duck, a rabbit? Okay. Ah, okay. So by turning the rabbit, our perceptions changed. It's still a rabbit. You're a little confused as to what it could possibly be. It's fun to watch how folks sit there and change their mind during the presentation and are beginning to believe that people may be seeing something out on the lake. Not sure exactly what it could be, but they do believe that there is something happening out on the lake. Uh, I was uh, working on the ferry boat Champlain coming back from Port Kent, New York on a hot August afternoon and uh, we were sitting up on the deck. And I was reading and happened to look up and came upon the sighting of these two fins that came out of the water. The folks that were with me sitting on the benches on the boat all ran up, pointed out, and asked what it is. And I was a crew member. And as a crew member, I had to, after the second one came out of the water, I had to explain that it definitely is champ. 
Everybody ran to the rail, and now everyone's jumping up down. Kids are picking up popcorn, throwing it in, feeding champ. Everybody is quite excited. And this was my first physical sighting, and I do believe that there is something here that is part of the, the lake's heritage. Three ferry boats service Lake Champlain between New York State and Vermont. Dozens of daily crossings with hundreds of passengers means thousands of pairs of eyes scanning the horizon at any time. I came to work for Lake Champlain Ferries in uh, 1980, in the spring of 1980. And I kayak a lot too out here. I house sit around here a lot. So um, plus my career here, I, um, I'm here a lot. And uh, uh, it's a pretty amazing place. Um, not a bad office. I do recall one spring where we had some high water and some wind and I was actually working on deck and uh, the captain I was working with, Cindy, um, we both saw this long chunk of something with a little thing coming up like this and it was clearly a log. I said, y y just wait, somebody's gonna come and ask us. And sure enough, maybe the following week, a woman came aboard with an eight, eight by 10 size photo of this chunk of log and she asked us did you see this at all and we said yes it's over there on that on that shoreline <laughs> and it's a big chunk so that's probably for me the closest you know that I can say there was something out there that looked like champ um, or looked like something unusual What they do see is a wonderful, uh, fertile uh, grounds for speculation. Uh, there are many uh, large animals in Lake Champlain, but large means five or six feet long, two meters perhaps. Uh, uh, we have uh, the sturgeon, the lake sturgeon. It's quite an impressive thing. There's a channel catfish that can be very large, uh, and uh, there also could be two or three uh, otters swimming uh, in succession, one behind another, behind another, playing and looking like it's a single animal. Now there are some other possible explanations for what people have seen that look dynamic, they look alive, and that can happen when uh, the wake of a boat, a wave train that uh, is called the bow wake from the prow of a boat that is moving uh, uh, through the lake, that is a chain of our train of waves that will pass right across the lake and be, be seen by people uh, far removed from the boat itself. The public is split into opposite camps where Champ is concerned. There are the believers and those who believe the lake monster is a far-fetched legend. The fact remains, more than 300 eyewitnesses are convinced about what they saw. Could all 300 individuals be mistaken? For the answer, it might be helpful to trace the monster's movements beginning in Bulwaga Bay. Jim Carroll is one of the few people who claim to have had two close encounters with Champ, experiences that he believes have taught him something about the creature's habits. Well, I've been on the lake for 40 years. Uh, we're out there all the time. Um, we go out a lot. We take a lot of people out. And uh, you're always looking. Every time you're on the water, you're always looking for Champ. At some point, somebody's going to capture something on film, and we're going to have proof. 
Jim's boat has all the equipment necessary to locate Champ, and he's set his compass heading for the specific locations where it's likely to be found. Passing tourists are a regular part of his expeditions. According to Jim, Champ only appears when the lake surface is relatively calm and the winds blowing from light to gentle. Jim bases his measurements on the Beaufort wind force scale. The scale allows him to calculate the strength of the wind by correlating its effects both on water and land. The Beaufort scale grades wind force from 0 to 10. The higher the number, the lower the chances of spotting Champ. Most sightings occur when the wind strength falls between 0 and 3. Today, Jim and his passengers get lucky. Conditions are ideal. So here we are, and uh, this is where we started. And when I was a kid, we were water skiing right here in the bay, just, uh, just off. Oh, that way? Yeah. It's time to get going at a water skier, we check, make sure he's okay. And then I turned around and looked off to the side of the boat, make sure, you know, you look ahead, make sure you're not gonna run anything over. And right next to the boat, there was something that was alive. wide, uh, this big long hump that was as long as the boat, it was this little 16 foot ski boat, it was a little disconcerting. Whatever it was was alive and just kind of disappeared into the water up front and, uh, and off to the back of the boat. So my buddy was driving, <clears throat> Did he, it, we grabbed the wheel, spun around, Went to the, the yeah, yeah, I'm like, get in the boat. He's like, but it's my turn to ski. Get in the boat. You can see where the farmland, the, the right hand yeah. one of those two, that's Arnold Bay. Were you afraid? You thought, yeah, I mean, didn't know what it was. Um, what, you know, how often do you see a fish that's bigger than the boat you're in? Uh, it's kind of like right out of Jaws. Did you no see it again? What? I did, as an adult. Um, we were actually, it was in this Twice? bay. Twice? Yeah. yeah. Um, my kids were little, and uh, we were out to dinner, and it was a nice night, and uh, we were just putting back because we had babysitters. And it was over here, on, uh, actually on this shore. We were just putting along, enjoying the warm weather and the flat calm. And, uh, my wife says, what's that? And because uh, I'd read up on Champ uh, a bit, and, gotten over the, that initial fear from way too long ago. Instead of turning the wheel and, and pulling away, we spun the wheel and we headed over towards it. And whatever it was, was, it was moving away from us. We moved after it um, and we watched it and it disappeared. And all of a sudden, it's on the other side of the boat. And uh, the couple that was with us, uh, fella was saying, um, well, you know, it's not champ. Like, yes, it is. Um, whatever it is, is alive. It was swimming and it moved away from us over here and it came back. Now it's on this side of the boat. Conditions are ideal. The chance for a monster meetup is as good as it gets. But Jim won't get his third encounter with it today. Champ is nowhere in sight. So with all of that, in the evenings, on a summer night, when you're looking out over the lake and you see something you're not quite sure about. Think about the fact that you might be seeing Champ. Anytime you have a conversation about Champ, you'll find people turn around and want to talk to you about this amazing creature. So uh, it's a very popular program that we do here at Echo. Samuel de Champlain first spotted Champ, the monster has never strayed very far from Port Henry. It's why Champ occupies a central place in the region's cultural heritage and tourism. Everyone has a story to tell, a monster to celebrate. Today, the storytelling is happening here in Port Henry's old library at a gathering of Champ's newest fans. 
This book is called Champ and Me by the Maple Tree by Ed Shankman. In the valley of Vermont, near a lake called Champlain, if you cut through the woods on the old country lane, you'll come to a meadow with one maple tree that's as high as a person can see. Do you believe that Champ is out there? Yes. Think he is? Yeah. Have you ever seen him? No. no. Have you known anybody who thought they saw him? Yes. Tell us a babysitter's husband. He thought he saw Champ because they have a nice view of the lake. And the story of Champ goes back not just into the 70s or the 80s, but you know, you talk to um, people that were, um, that grew up with my dad, you know, that fished on Lake Champlain, you know, they've seen something out there that, uh, that was different. Um, they, you know, even during the ice fishing season, they would see these shadows, you know, as they're sitting in their fish shanties and you, you know, you're looking down your hole and you're fishing, you, all of a sudden you just see this dark shadow, you know, fill the holes up and then bang, you can see down in there again. So I absolutely, I believe that um, definitely something out there. And, and again, you know, while you're visiting Port Henry, you know, I'm certain that, you know, most areas in the village of Port Henry, you can see Lake Champlain. So you're gonna be looking east and um, you're gonna be looking for our most famous resident, Champ. Port Henry is the hub for several annual Champ celebrations that draw scores of tourists to the area. Since the early 1990s, the first Saturday of August is declared Champ Day with activities for the whole family. Amidst street parades and sidewalk sales, Champ is honored as the local hero of the day. Later in the year on Labor Day, organizers invite Champ to be their guest of honor at the annual celebration. Alongside explorer Samuel de Champlain, Champ gets a chance to stroll down Main Street before submerging back into his watery home. This once feared monster has become one of the main attractions for visitors to the region. Campgrounds, festivals, and commercial promotions all feature Champ in some tasty way or another. Celebrity sea monster now appears more often out of water than it does in the lake itself. Champ's star power has been a windfall for the tourism industry. We started Champ's Trading Post because we found there was not really anyone out there who was doing Champ paraphernalia for sale for souvenirs. So we developed our own line that includes t-shirts and hats and shot glasses and mugs that have Champ on them. They've done really, really well for us. Um, we find that it's really helped our business having the name Champs and drawing people in. People come in, they say, oh, we've looked everywhere for Champ things, we're having a hard time finding them. Um, they're thrilled to be able to find what they're looking for, to take something home for their kids, or just a souvenir of, of being here looking for Champ. After you've been spending all this time looking for Champ, there's a couple interesting historical spots you may be interested in. One of them is at Crown Point, which is just to the south of here. Uh, and there's an old ruins of the old fort there, and you can just wander through. Something a little more structured is Fort Ticonderoga, which is a historic site. They do reenactments of the different battles that, was, that Fort Ticonderoga was involved in. The kind of people that come into our store are people that are know about the Champ legend, are intrigued by it, have their own stories. Some have a lot of questions. They've never heard of him. Um, and it's just fun to hear the different stories and to, you know, talk to people about what they think Champ is. And at the end of the day, sit out with a glass of wine on the deck and just enjoy the, the sun uh, on the lake and maybe you'll, in those last moments, you'll see Champ off in the distance. 
Fort Henry is a magnificent place. It is among the most beautiful places on earth. Lake Champlain is an incredible lake to behold and to enjoy. And I think the residents of Port Henry are incredibly lucky to have such beauty and such majesty in their backyard. If you come to Vermont near a lake called Champlain and you cut through the woods on the old country lane, there's a chance you will see my friend Champ and me playing happy and free by the old maple tree. And that's the end. When it comes to monsters, eyewitnesses, skeptics, researchers, and explorers all seem to agree. Champ is a full citizen of the communities around Lake Champlain. Now, Champ is part of who we are, Champy in New York, and also up in Quebec, very revered as uh, an iconic uh, sort of symbol for our area. There are potato chips also that are called Champ. There's different car washes champ. And of course, there are many different kinds of monuments. The lake monster for um, the baseball team here is champ. Lake Champlain is a lake that is powerful, dynamic, full of surprises. There's something mysterious and wild about Lake Champlain. Every single time I'm near the lake, whether I'm fishing, whether I'm sailing, um, my fishing tackle box, I carry a camera with me. I may be the next person who claims to have the definitive picture of the Lake Champlain monster. Well, you're always looking for that, um, for Champ. And uh, chances are that um, when you're here visiting, you're gonna spot him. I'm one of the people who actually saw Champ. I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> if you truly believe or you want to, just chant, just chip, and it's just chip, you know, just, you know, you never know. I'm serious. I'm, I'm not ready to close the book on Champ ever. I do believe everything I've seen, everything I've heard, and especially with this personal sighting of something physical that I could actually say, yes, that's why, you know, I'm here sharing this to let you know that it works, champ's good, and more, we need more champs, <laughs> certainly. So many people have such a great affection to the idea of a Champlain creature. And so I think the best habitat for champ uh, where Champ really lives is in the hearts and the minds of many, many people. This is the quintessential summer vacation for BC residents. The Okanagan Valley is located in the southern interior of British Columbia. It features a bit of everything, lakes, rolling hills, high mountains, valleys, and desert within its 21,000 square kilometers or 8,000 square miles. 
we're situated in a valley, so there's a lot of land that we can, you know, explore. Despite its huge size, the Okanagan has only about 350,000 full-time inhabitants. But in summer, that number swells with more than one and a half million tourists. People come here because it's the best weather in all of Canada. End of June until the end of August, the average temperature was anywhere from 28 to 30 degrees Celsius every day of the week. I mean, you just can't beat it. Dramatically beautiful natural surroundings. We have a very thriving agricultural scene. The apple orchards, the peaches, the pears. For people who love food and wine, this is the location. The wine region has just gotten totally insane. The wine is some of the best you'll ever find in the world. Like it's becoming, you know, the wine region of, of the north. Besides the wine and the fresh fruit, Mother Nature's other gift to the region is Lake Okanagan. First and foremost is, is the lake. The lake is very apparent, it's very beautiful, it's, it's very large, uh, provides a lot of recreational activities. Experts can't agree on the origin of the meaning of the word Okanagan. Some Aboriginal people say it's actually several words, one of which means big head. That might explain why some believe this lake is home to more than just water sports. This long, deep, prehistoric lake may be the home of something big, mysterious, frightening, something lying in wait below the surface. Recorded sightings date back to the 19th century. Native people's accounts go back even earlier. Every report confirms there is a sea monster in Lake Okanagan. Those who see it say it's heart-stopping. Look, it's rotating in the water. It's moving. I see three humps. Dad, get pictures! This is the beginning of evolution, from shark to, to dinosaur. And this creature is still alive. It's meant to survive. It can swim, it can fly, it can breathe underwater, it can walk on land, it has, it, it has ability to hide. It's unbelievable. If it doesn't look like a fish, it doesn't look like a snake, it's sometimes 25 feet long, 30 feet long. It tends to have a greenish color, is what people talk about, and it has uh, the face, or the history is, that it has the face of a horse. This huge black thing came out of the water, probably 40 or 50 feet away. The slimy, kind of shiny, like three, four feet out of the water, and big. I mean, this is not a fish. Lake Okanagan covers an area of 350 square kilometers or 135 square miles. The lake is 110 kilometers or 69 miles long and has a maximum depth of 242 meters. That's about 800 feet. That's more than enough natural habitat to support a strange creature with an even stranger name. What is Ogopogo? I mean, it's, we have to admit, it is, a, it is kind of a cute name with all the O's in it, almost like Mississippi, but it's Ogopogo. Ogopogo has never been caught, but people have been catching glimpses of the beast for a very long time. My father had seen it himself. Oh yes, he had seen it himself. Uh, I have, my grandmother has told me stories. I believe that it's possible that there could be something like an Ogopogo in our lake. It really varies what people talk about. Sometimes people don't see the animal at all, but they see is a strange you know, spout in the water or a strange movement in the lake. I would love to see it. I look for it all the time. Ogopogo has been uh, like almost this mythical creature that, uh, you know, that everybody is just fascinated with. Uh, as a newspaper man, I mean, you almost hate to say it, it sells newspapers. Uh, if I hear about a sighting of Ogopogo, it goes front page every single time. My name is Alan Gartrell. 
I've lived in Penticton since 1944. I have seen the beast. I'll tell you, I was up in Naramata for coffee at Ray Piper's place. It was February the 18th, 1984. There was no wind. The lake was like glass. And he looked out on the lake and he said, who's the idiot out there with a, with a speedboat this time of the year? And I looked at it and I said, it's not a speedboat. I said, that's a head out of the water. It's got a big, long neck on it, probably about 14, 16 foot neck on it. I started looking at it with my binoculars and when I started looking, it dove and it thrust with all four flippers. I went way down in the bottom of the lake, did a circle down there and came up right up the center and took fish off just about 10 feet from the top of the water. It did it 17 times for us. We had a real picture show in front of us and we did not have a camera. Just by what I saw, it looked like it had the power of two workhorses. It's real strong. In my books, it has to weigh probably 1,500 pounds. It's big. It's a 12 or 13 foot body on it. Its flippers have to be at least six feet long. Nobody gets a chance to see something like that. I took my brother-in-law and my daughter down the beach in kayaks, 2009. So I do a U-turn uh, at this underwater ledge and uh, the water's a little bit stirred up, but there's this orange-like creature under my kayak, uh, as big as my 18-foot kayak. And it's as wide as long. And, and, and I keep paddling, because I was afraid. It was right there. I have a picture of me uh, in a kayak, and beyond me is, is an object surfacing just, uh, just a kilometer down the beach. And this object in by scanning in the negative, looked like some kind of a, a alligator coming out of the water, uh, just sort of with its mouth open. I, I, I was very afraid. When I had my first sighting in 78, I, at that point in time, I was a, I was a skeptic, I, I'll have to admit. I didn't believe in Ogopogo. I was going to work. I lived on the west side at the time, and I was coming down the west side of the bridge. And as I'm going across the bridge to Kelowna, to the east, I look over, and couldn't believe there was something in the water, and it was traveling parallel to the bridge. So I stopped my car. I stopped my car, put the four-way flashers on, and of course there was traffic coming down the hill behind me. They all came and parked behind me, I get out over the railing, and what I'm seeing is three black humps moving parallel with the bridge towards Kelowna with what looked to me like a head going in and out of the water in the front. And I looked down, I looked to my right, and there had to be 40 people seeing the same thing with the cars all backed up. So anyway, I was all excited, and then it disappeared. I saw it for about 30 seconds. Bill Stechiak is among hundreds of eyewitnesses who include the earliest European settlers that arrived in the Okanagan Valley in 1811. But the first reports of a lake monster go back much further. Native peoples left behind many pictographs and oral histories of their first-hand experiences. What I find fascinating is the pictographs uh, that were drawn by the First Nations peoples. They obviously saw the same thing that people are seeing today and wanted to portray something that was so unusual, so fascinating to them that they wanted to document it. I mean, it's the equivalent to us going out and shooting video or shooting still photographs. White Haskell Hulk, he squeezed Jordan Cobo, couldn't tell Satu Hunut. Uh, we have always referred to the Ogopogo as Nkaka'it, which translates to the spirit of the lake. Our people know that there's more out there than just a lake. There's something in there that's, that's really deep and really meaningful to who we are as a people. 
Native elders have passed down stories about nomadic tribes offering sage and tobacco to Hoktik, the monster, in exchange for permission to cross the lake during their seasonal migrations. In return, Hoktik would calm the water for their safe passage. But one day, according to the legend, a tribal chief ignored the lake creature and refused to make the ritual offering. That had not been done. And so, and therefore, the lake really started, went from a nice, calm, peaceful setting to a really alive, really kind of daunting, scary lake. Uh, the waves can get rather high for being an inland lake. Um, and it was really dark, really cold. And Chief Kikinsula instructed his people to let go of the horses to uh, get across the lake as, as quickly as possible because there was something in the water that was not uh, being respected at the time. And as they were doing that, they heard the horses weaning. Um, some of the horses ended up going underwater, and they made it across the lake, but the horses had scars. Um, it looked like giant claw marks on their, the torsos of their bodies. Uh, some had bite marks in their bodies. When the first settlers arrived, you have to remember what the Okanagan was like. It was basically wild country. It was like what you would find if you went in, into northern British Columbia right now. So that when settlers came here, I mean, they were living right at the edge of the big forest. They had no idea what was here, what wasn't here, and stories about a lake creature that they got from the, uh, from the First Nations people probably scared the bejesus out of them. They believed the native stories and there were many um, frightful occurrences, many sightings. They actually posted armed guards on the uh, shores of Okanagan Lake. They used to patrol the beaches with their muskets uh, to protect their families, or they tried to capture it by running hooks out into the lake. I mean, it's the most incredible thing. These are tough people. I mean, hello, you know. So they must have seen something, and they, and they were very, very upset. They didn't know what to think, uh, but from the First Nations people, they had to take this as, as a serious threat. Locals and legends claim that a mysterious monster has been lurking in the depths of Lake Okanagan for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But how did it get here? What is it? And how has it managed to survive all this time without ever being captured? This lake has a prehistoric history, and uh, 10,000 years ago, it was quite a bit higher and longer than it is now, so all of this would have been underwater. So the theory is, is that many years ago, when this was open to the sea, uh, Ogopogo uh, came up and got into Okanagan Lake, chasing the salmon. When the glacier receded, it left behind a long, deep and narrow valley that filled with water as the ice melted. It gradually cut off access from the lake to the sea. Bill Stechuk believes Ogopogo is a prehistoric animal that became trapped in the lake. Got landlocked here and then uh, kind of lived here and kind of adapted to where he was. Species are either well adapted to an environment, in which case they persist, or they're not, and they die. They wow. become extinct. One animal which proves the theory that some species can adapt to a radically different environment is the Kokanee salmon, found only in Lake Okanagan and its tributaries. It's a landlocked salmon, and they still spawn in the uh, creeks in the area along the shorelines. It's a very interesting phenomenon because, of course, these fish came from the sockeye that used to be able to make it out to the ocean. So there is that question, could there be something um, in the water that we don't know about? It's a very deep lake. About 100 million years ago, the Plesiosaurus, a marine dinosaur with a long neck, flippers and a stubby tail, lived in what is now the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of North America. Descriptions of Ogopogo bear an uncanny resemblance to the prehistoric Plesiosaurus but there are other theories also. Some would say it's a very old species, in other words, one that was thought to be extinct, uh, 
but turned out not to be. And others would say Ogopogo and Loch Ness monsters were a new species in the sense that it was one un unknown to science. There's all kinds of species being found all the time, new ones, probably every week all over the world. And, you know, why couldn't something live here in the lake? Why couldn't the species in this body of water that's 90 miles long, it's incredible, it's four, it's two and a half miles wide. It's one of the deepest lakes in North America. Why couldn't something live here that hasn't been found? By restricting their search for Ogopogo only to the lake itself, hunters might be missing a creature that is living literally right under their feet. The Western perspective of Ogopogo, and I, and I fall victim to this all the time, is that because it's such a large creature that it, it's a male, they refer to Ogopogo as he all the time, and I, I definitely fall victim to that as well. Um, but our people tell stories of seeing multiple Ogopogos, which means that there has to be, you know, Science proves has to be a male and female to, to uh, recreate more Ogopogos or more in Kaka'i. Um, and there's stories of the Ogopogo being on, on beaches and even appendages to, to walk on the land with. Well, this is Pebble Beach. This is West Kelowna. Just down the beach is beach land. Andrew Bennett has developed a theory about how Ogopogo's been able to survive here for centuries. In the late 90s, he was leading a tour of native pictographs with a local Boy Scout troop when a small, unusual-looking salamander crossed their trail. When I saw this creature running uh, from the Boy Scouts, it was very timid and darted out of, out of view very fast. It did not fit any description or any picture that I was ever, ever able to find. My, my thought is that it is not a salamander. This is really... Uh, the part of the, the stage of this creature to, to be born on land and then go back into the water. Uh, life cycle. Andrew believes they had stumbled upon a newborn Ogopogo that day, heading towards the water, like young turtles do soon after they hatch. This encounter piqued his curiosity. If Ogopogo has a nearby nest, he'll try to find it. Just what's going over in my mind, there must be some more, some more to this spot. A few weeks later, Andrew Bennett returns to the same location, this time armed with a camera and determined to record some hard evidence. Bennett takes a series of photos he says proves Ogopogo laid a nest here. He keeps his distance so that he doesn't disturb the site or scare away the creature. He also photographs the nearby shoreline where Ogopogo likely exits and enters the lake. Uh, I took pictures underwater pictures, what looked like logs, and, and then I was going through my pictures and, and uh, realizing, oh, maybe there's something more to it. And then I realized that th this was not a log, this was a creature, it had a, a flipper. Obviously that looked like Ogopogo. It, it was long, it was only maybe a foot wide and maybe 18 feet long, and, uh, and a closer examination, you can see an eye and a lizard head and a tongue sticking out. I didn't know before that it was so lizard-like, but anyway, that's what, what seemed to come out in the pictures. Later, Bennett enlarges his high-resolution photos and discovers what he believes is evidence of newly hatched Ogopogos, like this one. And this one, a single unhatched egg on a pile of debris. There's an egg and a creature coming out of it, still hatching, and, and then there's all these young ones all around it, all very well camouflaged. Its orange color is hid by the orange leaves in the crevice. It's really, really good camouflage. Bennett concludes that Ogopogos are masters of disguise. You would swear it was a log, and you would see these pictures, you would swear they're logs, but they really aren't. There, there's an eye, there's a nostril, there's a tongue sticking out. There's, there, there's details that just aren't in logs. Uh, this camouflage has evolved over millions of years and, and it, it is almost perfect. 
it just can sit there. Even a shark has a hard time sitting in one place uh, for more than half an hour, but this creature can sit there for hours and, and just pretend it's a log. And, and then the the, uh, the part of it that tells you that it's not a log is you, if you go back there, the log is gone. Like some of his other photos of driftwood and logs, Bennett believes this one is unmistakably Ogopogo on the move. Uh, and, and this is its home. This is where it, it lays, hatches eggs up here and in the water. It, it lives here. So last four or five years, I think in many pictures of this area, and I'm convinced this is the home of Ogopogo. Bennett's photos lead him to one startling conclusion. Ogopogo isn't one animal. There's an entire species thriving in Lake Okanagan. A few years ago, I took a picture of the head peeping out of a cave on the bottom of the lake, about 14 feet under. And it looks just like Ogopogo. Skeptics see another interpretation in Bennett's photos. There's lots of trees around Lake Okanagan. Floating and sunken logs are commonplace. One of the first reports to mistake a drifting log for a monster dates back 140 years. A Mrs. Susan Allison had a sighting and she saw this object which she thought was a pine trunk, a, a, a tree trunk, but then she saw it was moving against the wind. Nevertheless, Bennett is convinced some moving objects are the creature cruising on the surface, perhaps on the hunt. Any kind of dinosaur-like creature that has lived that long can obviously quickly destroy a person, so uh, I did not want to experiment by lifting it up. Um, it, it just seemed too dangerous. And even though it, it has its, its advantage in its, in its camouflage, my fear is uh, that, that the, eventually uh, the creature will be hunted and that would not be my wish. My wish is, is that the, the species at risk would identify the creature and then protect it. Eyewitnesses, fuzzy photographs, and a handful of theories, but no corpse has turned up on the shores of Lake Okanagan. Without that, Ogopogo the lake monster remains a myth. The more recent pictures that you see, none of those pictures really have been scientifically verified as Ogopogo, but there is definitely, you know, those, those are pictures of the lake that people don't take every day and don't see every day, so. Bill Stechuk never forgot the time he spotted Ogopogo back in 1978. It was so intense that he decides to recreate that day in a short film. What we were doing is we were reenacting what my first sighting in 1978, and of course, I was a little younger then, so my son played me. Incredibly, Stechak doesn't have to restage the main event. And out of the blue, something appears in the lake. Look, the three humps. One, two, three. You mean those glistening white? That is not a wave. You think, I mean, what are the chances? You know, it's like it's so rare to see Ogopogo, and he shows up for a film crew. And we had all the extras there, the film crew. We had 14 people there. It wasn't one person who saw this. 14 people. Look at it move. And everybody starts screaming, and they're turning the television cameras towards it. Look, it's rotating in the water. It's moving. I see three humps. Whoa, wait a minute. Are you filming this? And it, the most incredible part of it is nobody is acting in this. They're looking at this, and we've got the audio. And it's the most incredible audio you've ever heard. Really, really good stuff. I don't know what to say other than my breath was taken away. I started freaking out, basically. <laughs> Dad, get pictures! Hello. <laughs> there was obviously something there that wasn't natural, that wasn't quite proof, but was so tantalizing as to, you know, as to make the day, make the week, make the production for that film crew. We saw something. Convinced that what he filmed was the lake monster, in 1999, Stechuk assembles a research team and spends three weeks on the lake looking for scientific evidence. It was great. We had 75 people involved. We spent three weeks on the lake, and we got some really good results. 
With a houseboat, a team of divers, sonar, underwater submersibles, and cameras, Stechak conducts the most intense scientific expedition ever assembled. The investigation begins here at Rattlesnake Island and Squally Point. Native legends point to this area as the Ogopogo hotspot. It's just a small island that the First Nations used for their sacrifices to Ogopogo. And uh, I guess at one time they had a lot of rattlesnakes on it, so <laughs> that's why it got its name. Divers go down to a depth of 100 feet looking for a cave and signs of the beast. And that's where you've got these sheer drop off, these sheer walls that go down like two, three hundred feet, which is just incredible. This cave was at a hundred feet down, it was about 14 feet wide, and there was actual colder water coming out of the cave into the lake from some kind of underground spring or whatever. Would the cave lead the divers to another body of water? Perhaps Lake Okanagan isn't landlocked at all and actually connects to the Pacific Ocean. They don't know how far that cave goes in. And Bill Stasiak said that he's got his divers had went into the cave and there's too much water coming out of the cave and makes it too hard for the divers to swim into the cave. Our divers, of course, they, they get a little panicky and they didn't go very far in, so who knows what's in there? And that's just one, one cave on the wall. So there are other places in the lake where water is entering. Really interesting stuff. The first stage of the expedition gives the team some intriguing but inconclusive evidence. The next stop, however, propels the venture into high gear. Hey, Bill, there's something on the soda over here. Yeah, look at that. They had this, this side scan sonar, which is a quite an advanced type of sonar. Sonar emits sound waves, which strike an underwater target and rebound back to the transmitter. These waves appear on the sonar screen as images. The team is now looking at something moving slowly across the bottom of the lake. There is something in the water. That sound would not have been bounced back if it didn't hit an object. They found something two to 300 feet down in the water, something huge that there was no way it could be a, a, a bunch of fish. And they said, you know, we don't know what it is, but there's something there. I guess we better get the ROV down then. Okay. Wasting no time, the team deploys the ROV, a remotely operated vehicle and camera. We estimate that the target itself was 17 meters long. But the ROV arrives too late. Huge and then disappeared. Yeah, it was like 266 okay. feet of water. It was right there. Okay, uh, we had it on two sweeps of the sonar. Uh, the third sweep, it went below our beam and we lost it. But whatever that was, was huge and it was a solid sonar return and it was moving. It moved 10 degrees port to starboard. This could be Ogopogo. Could be, but not good enough as hard data. More weeks of intense searching turns up nothing. If Ogopogo does exist, it got away once again. As far as I know, nobody has ever actually produced scientific evidence. I mean, there's been $1 million and $2 million rewards for proof of the existence of Ogopogo, and nobody has claimed the reward. We've had people all through the years come and see if they can find something and, and uh, find definitive evidence of the existence of Ogopogo, but uh, it has remained elusive. There are some people who absolutely say, I've seen something, I can't explain it. Um, and then you get those that say, absolutely not, it's just a big fish or it's a current or whatever. In general, I'm a skeptic. Uh, that's sort of a, a lifestyle. I feel like coming here and talking about Ogopogo like this, I'll be the equivalent to the guy who told your kid there's no Santa Claus. 
sorry to those who uh, may be, might be upset by this. There's a lot of people that believe Ogopogo is just a giant sturgeon. Um, I guess that could be a kind of a scientific analysis of the Ogopogo. The beaver. <laughs> I would liken it to, to the Santa Claus story. Oh, well, I've born and raised here. I've never seen it. <laughs> At least not when I was sober, but. <laughs> I think it's a wave. <laughs> My grandfather used to swear he's seen it, but he intended to be yes a little bit, so. It's an old lake. It's a really deep lake. So I suppose there could be something, but I think it's just a big fish. I don't know. Gopogo himself seems to be a bit of a tease. It's like, come up and just show myself briefly and, uh, and tease the tourists, and then I'll disappear and leave them wondering. Was it really a Gopogo, or was it a fish, or was it just a series of waves? Witnesses, in general, are honest. They are reporting also, in my experience, more or less what they're seeing. But actually, it's a mistaken conclusion. Often, cameras do lie. Sometimes it's because deliberate hoaxes are, are made. And sometimes it's because a picture is taken which is a little bit ambiguous and then perhaps people begin to attach importance to it. I come on this trail 50 to 100 times a year, and I sometimes see unusual waves in the middle of the lake. And, and, and one day I was walking along and I saw one, and there were four people coming along behind me. And I stopped and I said, what do you think of that over there? And they stopped and they said, oh wow, that's a humongous animal under there. Uh, and uh, I said, well, or it's just, a standing wave in a quiet lake. There's a lot of scientists that say that it's just, it's just waves, okay? And, and certainly, there are waves, and people take pictures of waves. Motorboats, large fish, and swimmers cause waves. But according to eyewitnesses, some waves defy all logic. Skeptics, you know, you can't blame people for being skeptical. But at the same time, there are humps, and there are heads, and it's moving through the water. And what about the waves that appear from nowhere? They're the hardest phenomenon to explain away. Our lake is, is calm and flat. And then all of a sudden, you get this, this w wave coming from the middle of nowhere in the middle of the lake. That where did it come from? It's just like in the middle. Yeah. And it's this big rolling thing that could look like a monster. I don't know. <laughs> it has to be the monster. It just has to be. What else could it be? <laughs> well, we see a wave, but there's no boat. It must be an animal, OK? And well, there are other things that it could be. There's pockets of methane gas in the sediment, and it releases instantaneous, which causes all kinds of bubbling and, wa and steaming at the surface. And that's been seen many times, and that's also uh, been taken for a sighting of Ogopogo. It's as much a process of rationalization as imagination. So, for example, these logs which move upwind uh, can be caused by what are known as seiches, internal seiches, whereby the warm water from a summer's warming can be pushed by the wind to one end of a lake and then will flow back again, causing underwater waves. Now, you don't really see those waves at the surface, but if there's an object on the surface, like a tree trunk, then it will move against the wind. And you need to, a little bit of general science to understand that. We know from the physics that fluids moving in a gravitational field will form something called a gravity wave created simply because of the difference in temperature. When that corrects, the uh, water will actually start to form waves. The other questions you can ask too, that there's some sort of submarine cave linking all of these things is geologically ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it would have to go under major mountain passes and thrust systems and volcanic terrains and things. I mean, you know. Uh, number one. And number two is it's supposedly an air-breathing animal. And uh, how is it going to swim hundreds and hundreds of kilometers underwater without access to the air? 
people will scoff and laugh, but everybody that, that, that's seen something in the lake has been ridiculed. But you, you just have to take it because it's a real thing. Uh, people laugh at me when I tell them what I saw, but they can laugh all they want. What I saw, I saw. The last fellow told me, he says, yeah, you probably saw that beaver out in the lake. Well, it's, it's 3,000 times bigger than a beaver. <laughs> I think if you believe in dinosaurs and all of the things that are now extinct, you have to believe that there could be something like that still living in a deep, deep lake like the Okanagan Lake. Finding that scientific proof is something that some people need. Um, our people, the West Bank First Nation people, the seal people of this area, uh, don't believe that you need to see something to believe it. All of us want to believe. I think it's wonderful to have the myth. I think Santa or, or the Ogopogo is, is a great addition to Kelowna's story. Do I believe in it? No, but I'm not going to debunk the myth because I think the myth is fun. The days of being afraid to go swimming in Lake Okanagan or making ritual sacrifices to a lake monster named Ogopogo are a thing of the past. These days, the creature has resurfaced again, not as a beast, but as tourism's best friend. The creature that, that was feared by the early settlers is not the creature that we see now. We see this fuzzy green toy in the department store, so there's this very benign creature which is not what the experience of the early settlers was. Rebranding a lake monster into something the tourist industry can sink its teeth into involved a name change. The original native word, Hoktik, lacked a touch of playfulness. And basically, people didn't like the native name, I guess, back in the beginning, and they came up with this Ogopogo name from a song. They took a British dance hall ditty. His mother was an earwig, his father was a, and I can't remember the rest of it. And it just became sort of everybody's pet project. And when you see this little creature at, in, encased in cement at the foot of the main street, uh, the children are climbing all over it and absolutely nobody's afraid of it. Of course we don't talk about sacrifices to the monster. <laughs> Since nobody's ever died from him or her or whatever, I think he's friendly. <laughs> he's got the smiley face and everything else, okay? Towns and cities around Lake Okanagan have all adopted the colorful and cuddly monster as their own. Of course, there's also a commercialized aspect of Ogopogo, uh, the more cuddly, um, you know, stuffed animal version of Ogopogo that uh, you can purchase in the tourist centers and stuff like that. Lots of people look for Ogopogo, and they're, you know, very sane people. And I believe there's something in the lake. He's a friendly fella. He hasn't eaten too many tourists yet. He doesn't eat people. He eats plants. He eats ice cream at Ogos. <laughs> My name is Sharon Brown and I live in Penticton, BC, where I run and own an ice cream shop called Ogo's Ice Cream. We have our ice cream that's named after Ogo Pogo. It's a vanilla black licorice orange ice cream. Very bright and colorful. The kids really love it because of its color. People come in, they're happy. They're coming for a happy experience. And it's a really, really happy place to be. The people love the monster. You know, Okanagan Lake and the Ogopogo. It's what, what the lake's about. Certainly we have images of Ogopogo all around town. We have a mosaic of Ogopogo. Um, you'll see businesses that are called Ogopogo whatever. There's an Ogopogo Rotary Club. There's an Ogopogo Swim Club. There's the Ogopogo Zone of the Canadian Ski Patrol Club. Ogopogo Tours, you know? We'll take you out on the lake and there's a chance you can see Ogopogo. It's a great marketing tool. Keep your eyes open because you never know. You never know when he could appear. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a great tourist promotion. I own and operate a bed and breakfast and it's called Ogopogo. 
Ocopoco B&B, perfect place to be, you know? The, the sales has become almost emblem emblematic of Kelowna. It's used in the city logo. It's used on all, all kinds of different stationery. It's, it's kind of become the sim symbol of Kelowna. But then right beside it, they see the Ogopogo. It's a focal point for the tourists. If people want to believe there's an Ogopogo, it's great. I love this place. So yeah. if it brings people to look for an Ogopogo, sure. The jury's still out on whether Lake Okanagan has a man-eating sea monster or a shy prehistoric vegetarian. Then again, it may be only a great story to attract tourists. In any case, Ogopogo has become an integral part of the breathtaking scenery. Yet it may be more than that. There's so much deep water stretching for over 100 kilometers or nearly 70 miles that no one should completely write off the possibility Ogopogo does exist. People may come to try to find Ogopogo, exploring the depths of, of Okanagan Lake. But it's not something that has to be feared. It's something to be respected, and, and it has to be believed in to, to really experience it, I think. I think it's actually kind of neat that nobody's been able to prove or disprove that there is an Ogopogo. I mean, people love the stories. People read the stories. They're, they're avid followers of Ogopogo. They, they, they'd, like, you know, they'd like nothing better to know that he exists, but at the same time, it's kind of neat that he, there's been no proof because the myth goes on. There's been an incredible change in, uh, in attitude with people about Ogopogo, and, and I've seen that over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, there's less skeptics now. Uh, I think people are starting to come to grips with the fact that, you know, there, there, could, have, there could be an animal that lives in this lake. Uh, there, we're certainly finding new species all over the world almost every week that we didn't know existed. It's a great draw for Kelowna. Uh, and the fact that there's actually something here is just remarkable. Uh, and, and this is its home. This is where it, it lays, hatches eggs up here and in the water. It, it lives here. This deserves to be protected. Ogopogo has plenty of fans who believe in it and want it left alone. Even the creature itself is never caught. People who visit Lake Okanagan are definitely hooked. Ocopogo is unpredictable. You never know when he's going to show up. And of course, he's always going to show up when the camera's not ready, when the camera's not focused, when you left the camera in the car. He always seems to show up when you're least likely to be able to provide proof that he exists. They're looking to find that, that, that scientific proof that Ogopogo exists. And I don't think that's really necessary, but you know, it keeps the spirit alive. It is an ongoing story. Um, you know, I might not find the, the scientific evidence to prove that, but there, it's, it's something that I believe in my heart and what my elders have always taught me is that if you believe it in your heart to be true, then it can't be wrong. Nestled on the shores of Lake Pepin, Lake City is a small resort town in southeastern Minnesota. If you're a tourist in Lake City, the, the lake is a wonderful thing in itself to see. Lake Pepin witnessed the birth of one of the most popular water sports on the planet. This is the birthplace of water skiing. Since the early 1900s, we've had, during the 4th of July period, a uh, water ski day festival. Crossed by the Mississippi River, Lake Pepin has been an important shipping route since pre-Columbian times thanks to its strategic location. Straddling the border between Wisconsin and Minnesota and 100 miles south of the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, the lake is the widest point on the Mississippi. Old legends have it that a terrifying creature haunted these seemingly peaceful waters. And even more terrifying, if we are to believe recent reports, that monster might still be alive to this day. 
the fishermen, actually when they saw it, they turned their boat around and came back off the water. They saw some gigantic sonar, you know, reading on the, on the bottom of the lake. I know that they had a diver in the lake that ran into something that he didn't know what it was and he didn't want to go back in. And it was like I was being watched or something, like something out there was watching me. Many of the tribes were frightened of the area. They were talking about a creature between the size of an elephant and a rhinoceros. They were talking of a giant 40-foot snake-like serpent. My sister had fallen off, off of the water skis. She was afraid. Uh, we pulled her out of the water pretty quickly, and she has not been in the water since then. I've been out on that water many times. I've seen a whole lot of weird things. I've been out on the water when it's real rough. It's hard to see down into the water. So late at night, at dusk, um, at sunrise, you can see things poking out. Something surfaced that was maybe five or six feet out of, you know, lengthwise and maybe six or seven inches that came out of the water. And he saw a creature out of the water about four feet came out to grab a flying bird. He was so terrified, he removed his children and they left. They quit fishing because they didn't want to be the next thing that monster came after. Right at that point, as I got thrown around and I was freaked, scared to death. It's big. It's got to be it. I was screaming. I honestly don't remember exactly what I was screaming, to tell you the truth. Most of the people who saw it were terrified of it. But I was saying something like, it's big, it's big, it's dark, it get me out of the water. There's weird stuff out there. There's weird stuff in the lake. I could feel her fear. She wanted to get out of that water very quickly. Out of these disturbing testimonies, a name emerges, Pepe. Well, Pepe has a long history dating back to at least the 1600s with the first Native Americans here. People for over 100, 200 years have been seeing this monster and by many accounts, it's a terrifying beast. Many of the tribes were frightened of the area that if anyone went missing or anyone did not come back, they blamed it on the monster in Lake Pepin. If anyone died or any tribesmen you know, drowned, they blamed it on the creature. So it was looked at that you should avoid the lake at all possibilities because if you didn't, you might encounter this creature. And many of the tribes only took their strongest and sturdiest canoes out on the lake because they were so frightened of what was underneath. Explorers would always bring a Jesuit priest with them because that was who could read and write back then in the 1600s, 1700s. The average person, and even royalty, couldn't read or write, so they would send clergy along to document the trip. They were on Lake Pepin. At the time, Lake Pepin was already, already found and already named, uh, so they knew about Lake Pepin. And uh, the notation says, we were on Lake Pepin today, saw a large creature swimming on the lake. We don't know what it was. And back in the 1800s, they sometimes called it a sea monster, a sea serpent, a marine monster, a beast of the lake, even a snake beast. So you have to look at all these different terms of what these people were encountering. I came across the 1871 report, uh, just kind of researching around and came across the notation. A uh, pair of local gents say they saw something swimming on the lake or lake monster, they called it. Larger than a rhinoceros, but smaller than an elephant. What's interesting about Lake Pepin and the Pepe monster is that it wasn't unusual in the 1800s 
there were dozens of lakes, rivers, and streams in Wisconsin and Minnesota that had legends of a beast, a monster in their lakes. But what's interesting about Pepe is that most of these other lakes and rivers, the creatures seem to have died out. The report just kind of stopped. Whereas Pepe, starting back in the 1970s, really resurfaced. That back in the 1970s, reports started to come back out more and more Whereas today, we're getting just as many reports of Pepe as we did back in the 1800s. And I have talked to people who say or swear that they've seen something unexplainable in this lake. In fact, many of the old clamors back at the turn of the century referred to incidents that took place in the lake that were just unexplainable. Huge, huge body um, motions in the lake, water movement in the lake that was couldn't have happened by any normal means. We get a lot of questions about Pepe. Um, Pepe is um, quite a, a, a tale. Um, my husband actually saw Pepe and took a picture of Pepe. Since the first sighting of a strange creature in Lake Pepin in 1871, nearly 1,900 reports have been made. So many strange encounters that up to now have gone unexplained. 200 years before the CU ceded their land to the U.S. government, fur traders discovered the majestic beauty of the Lake City region. The name Pepin was given to the lake in memory of Jean and Pierre Pepin, two brothers who set up a trading post there in the late 17th century. The archives of this period mention mysterious apparitions. We are in Lake City, Minnesota. Canada's borders to our north. Our city is split by two counties, Wabasha County and Goodyear County, the state of Minnesota. We are on the Mississippi River, which happens to be, at this particular point, the widest and the deepest part of the Mississippi River. Lake City is kind of unique. We have about seven miles of public shoreline on the lake, where it's open to the public, where you can go and stand there, fish, wade, swim, uh, do whatever you want, and uh, or just sit and enjoy the scenery you know, at the water's edge. And uh, a lot of people do that, and, and that's where a lot of people see see Pepe. And uh, we have Pepe Watch stations set up. You'll see signs every now and then along the beach. My friend for the that works for the Division of Natural Resources pulled up this really weird looking fish, and it was maybe a foot and a half long, and it had really big teeth, almost the head almost looked like a piranha. He knew what it was, so we, but he did say that it was a prehistoric fish. And uh, when he cut it and cleaned it out, it still moved for a couple of hours after he had done the evisceration and everything. In fact, Lake Pepin is home to fish of incredible shapes and sizes, which has led some to speculate that Pepe could be a surviving member of a species long considered extinct. What I find interesting about Pepe, the description of Pepe, is it varies widely. That there are some accounts of it that make it seem more of a, uh, though it's an old dinosaur, the plesiosaur, the long neck, like you'd consider the Loch Ness Monster. Based on the descriptions people have called us with and, and provided us, um, we think Pepe is probably 15 to 20 feet long. Um, at least part of him is serpent-like. There are other reports of it being more of a giant serpent, snake-like beast, 30 to 40 feet in length. And then there are some where it's more of a several humps of whatever is unknown, some creature that's unknown. We think it probably has a thicker body uh, in, a, in a long neck uh, with the head. Um, but, you know, that's the mystery with aquatic creatures is you don't get to see the whole thing most of the time. You only see part of it. it you know, they're, they're like icebergs. Most of the sightings of its color seem to indicate that it's a dark type beast, that it's a, a brown or a black or a dark green. It's always seen as a dark type creature. The Shimbanos are longtime residents of Lake City. 
They operate a small cafe on the path along Lake Pepin. Adam Shimbano recalls as if it happened yesterday, an incident that traumatized his sister during an outing on the lake in the early 1980s. We were about 15 or 16 years old. We were out water skiing uh, just north of town and my sister had fallen off, off of the water skis. You know, you pull around and you swing around to pick her up. And we picked, as, as we did that, you know, I'm sure we were horsing around and stuff. And somehow, uh, Chris, the guy that we were with and I, you know, we weren't really paying attention to her. And she hollered something. I, you know, I don't remember, this was 30 years ago, and she was, and I looked at her, and you know, it's caught my attention, and I, I'm like, what, Shelly? And her eyes were like this big. She's like, there was something in the water right here. And I said, what are you talking about? And she was adamant that she wanted to get out of the water. She was afraid. And she scrambled out of the water uh, we pulled her out of the water pretty quickly, and she has not been in the water since then here in Lake Pepin. And so she hasn't swam in the lake for 30 years. What we've learned is people that are in the water and they see, they have a, what's called a close encounter with Pepe. They, they, it, it, they kind of shakes them up for a while. And they certainly want to get out of the water right then. And they aren't too eager to go back in the water uh, in the near future. You know, eventually that changes. Uh, it, but, but they are a little bit nervous to start with. And I guess I can kind of understand that if anytime you see something that scares you, I mean, I, I don't really like snakes too much myself. If I all of a sudden see a snake a foot away from me, I usually jump back and then I'm on the watch for <laughs> snakes after that. She said it was a black and it, she could make out a fin of some kind, but it, she said she couldn't really see how big it was, but she could tell that it was quite large under the water. We've heard stories that there used to be big sturgeon that lived in this lake. Um, you know, I said, it's just a fish. And she, no, it was not a fish. It was big and it was scary. And, you know, to this day, we've never really talked about it much. Larry Nielsen is a businessman active in the Lake City community. A few years ago, he came across ancient manuscripts describing strange sightings on Lake Pepin and was so intrigued that he decided to investigate himself. He is now captain of the Pearl of the Lake, a replica of a 19th century paddle wheel boat that scours the lake in search of Pepe. Larry Nielsen really brought Pepe back. It was nearly forgotten for many decades. People talked about it in the area. But outside of the community, it wasn't that well known. About five or six years ago, I was uh, actually watching a show on television about the Loch Ness area. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to get a bunch of people that come here and try and find out what Pepe is? And uh, what's the best way to do that? What's the best way to get some interest in finding out what Pepe is? And that's, uh, I thought about it for a while, and that's when I came up with, well, I'll offer a reward for anybody that can prove the existence of Pepe. And I sent out about 100 emails to different news organizations and news media um, that we're offering a $50,000 reward for anybody that can provide proof of what Pepe, the Lake Pepin monster is. And then uh, from there, a few newspapers picked it up, uh, news stations, uh, and, and a lot of uh, national media started picking it up. We are on national public radio. Uh, uh, then it grew exponentially from there. We, we started getting uh, inquiries from around the world 
Uh, I was actually on the largest radio station in Tokyo, Japan for 20 minutes talking about uh, Pepe and uh, Chinese government had uh, uh, a website that talked about Pepe a little bit and I've gotten phone calls from Australia and Sweden and, and uh, just about every country and every state around. People are really, really interested in what's going on here on Lake Pepin. Well, let's throw out the map, Larry, and you can show us, uh, we'll look at some of the most common areas for the sightings and then we can pick where we want to sure. go today. Well, these orange uh, flags here uh, are sightings that you've documented, or, or is that right, Chad? Yes. Okay. Dating back to the 1860s up until you know current time. We are right here right now. Uh, matter of fact, where our dock is located is called Central Point because it is in the center of Lake Pepin. So, mm -hmm. so we're centrally located here. Um, and as we go downstream, uh, the water gets deeper, uh, 85 to 100 feet deep in places. Or we, uh, uh, one of the favorite spots seems to be up between Stockholm and Maiden Rock Bluff. And mm -hmm. uh, Maiden Rock Bluff is, is uh, for some reason, seems to have a lot of sightings right around that area. You can see that's Maiden Rock, Wisconsin yeah. in the background. That's the creature. Yeah, and, and, uh, and several other ones that are in the same vicinity. So yeah. I, I think we definitely want to hit that area. Uh, and uh, I think we'll have some good successes. Yeah, you can see we'll be right in the hot spot. Yeah, yeah. All I'm right. excited. Let's get Let's going. Do it. Yeah. Our boat, uh, it's a 129 passenger paddle wheel boat. It's, a, it's an authentic paddle wheel boat. It doesn't have any propellers or thrusters. It's uh, just the paddles is what makes it go through the water. We do some uh, peppy tours on the boat where we take them out, uh, specifically we call them Peppy Watch Tours. Uh, we show them the historic areas, the scenic areas, and we talk about Peppy and, and uh, we talk about the reward. So, and tell them, so everybody keep your cameras ready because uh, not only are you gonna uh, get shots of all this great scenery, but you might just make yourself 50,000 bucks. We're coming up right here to uh, Marina Point, which is uh, where Lake City Marina is. It's the largest marina on the Mississippi River. And uh, we'll go around that point, uh, go downstream a little bit, and then we're gonna cross the lake and head up uh, upstream along the Wisconsin shore towards Maiden Rock and uh, see if we can't find Pepe. So I think what's interesting is we always talk about it being a, a single creature, but in actuality, there may be several of these creatures, especially if there have been hundreds of years of sightings that there may be enough to reproduce. I've always felt like there has to be a pod or, or several creatures um, because I, I just don't see, you know, the, the sightings go back hundreds of years mm -hmm. and I don't see how any one creature could be alive that long. Yes. So uh, I think there's a small community of them, uh, and probably they're they're fairly large, so just the size of them probably keeps the number in the community down uh, mm -hmm. to a certain degree because uh, you know we aren't the ocean with unlimited depth and places to go. So I, I think you're right. I think there's got to be more than one. Based on a lot of the reports I've received that. Whether the creature is harmless or cute or not, people were afraid of it. And of course, if you're swimming in the water, water skiing, boating, and a large beast 30 to 40 feet, by some accounts, even 10 feet, comes up next to you, that's gonna be terrifying, whether it's a sturgeon, whether it's a giant catfish, a bull shark, or an unknown species. Um, we know that there is no reports of it ever hurting anybody, taking a bite out of somebody's leg or, or uh, other than we have a report that, that you found from some people down uh, by Alma where uh, a, a creature jumped out of the water about four feet and snatched a bird out of the air. And, and that's really the only sighting we have where it's actually feeding on anything. Yeah, I had traveled the world searching for these monsters and legends, and I'd never heard of a reward being offered for their capture. So that's really what intrigued me right away. Not necessarily the reward itself, 
but the mystery surrounding it, it gave it that, that strength to it, that not only were there reports of it, but somebody was putting up a reward to find the truth behind it. Well, you know, I hear from several different people that have had expeditions that, that they're interested in the reward, but I don't think that is their main impetus. I think they have a desire to solve mysteries. Yes. And, and uh, if they get a reward for doing it, that's just uh, icing on the cake. But yes. what they really want is, here's a mystery. It's documented for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, it's unsolved. Let's solve this mystery. Yes. Everybody, everybody wants to solve a mystery. In 2009, Heidi Fryer, a filmmaker from Wisconsin, led a self-funded expedition to document the existence of Pepe and perhaps win the $50,000 reward. On their very first outing, the team had a disturbing encounter. The detailed account of what happened that day has become a part of Lake Pepin lore. It was that summer, um, the summer of 2008, I believe, that I saw an article on the front page of the St. Paul Pioneer Press newspaper talking about Pepe and the $50,000 reward being offered for proof of Pepe's existence. Well, one of the people on the expedition was a scuba diver, and he was planning to go down and see what he could see underwater. Corey was a little reluctant to dive in Lake Pepin. And I had told myself a long time ago I would never do it. I ended up getting over the fear of going into the dark, murky water of the Mississippi, something that I had been scared to do since as a kid. We went out on the, on the river. From the time we left the boat landing, we were only on the boat or on the water for about five minutes. Our sonar reader was seeing something unusual on the graph. I've never seen anything that big on a graph. Well, it's two feet. It's two feet every foot. So it's 50. So we were seeing a 50-foot cone at that depth. It's still scary. That's. 50 feet. I've never, I've never in what, 10, 15 years of using this graph, I've never seen anything close to that. Because it was about 25 feet. We were in 36 feet of water, it was 25 feet down. I'm thinking that, put, and it took up about two thirds of the screen. So that it's gotta be huge. Yeah. Big. At that time, I put my scuba gear on and worked up the nerve, did a back flip over into the water. And it was like maybe 10, 15 minutes into it, I was kind of getting comfortable, you know, getting that fear gone. And, and uh, it, right at the end there, I, I everything just kind of went quiet. I had a feeling come over me, like just a, 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 a tingly feeling in my head and in, in my ears or whatnot. And it was like I was being watched or something, like something out there was watching me. And right about that time, I seen something real close to me in black in color, kind of looked smooth. I never touched it, nor did I, do, I don't believe it touched me. I didn't see any kind of fins or head or anything like that. But as quick as I seen it, all of a sudden it, it moved and I seen it like move and left. And it kind of threw me around like a whirlpool or, or a wave that was, you know, up straight up and down. And it, right at that point, as I got thrown around and I was freaked. Well, I, I, I see it, it's big took off to the surface, seen where the bolt was, and my regulator flew out of my mouth. It's gotta be it. It's booked. When Corey came out of the water, I was worried about him. Oh, get me out of this water. It's big. I bumped into it. He was obviously terrified, and we didn't know what had happened.
and I was screaming to get my buddy to pull me out of the water, and it felt like forever. You know, I was just imagining this thing coming up and grabbing me or something, you know, and disappearing forever. And he finally got me up over into the boat. I was completely exhausted. You know, they had kind of asked me if I was all right. I, you know, I said I was all right, but that, it just kind of ended right there as far as my, my experience of, of that. The experience could not be filmed as severely reduced visibility prevented the underwater camera from taking pictures at a depth greater than one meter. But the filmmaker, who is still trying to understand what the sonar captured that day, intends to continue her documentary project. Despite high hopes, no observations recorded in the past 150 years have helped prove the existence of a monster or unexplained phenomenon in Lake Pepin. The many photos submitted by alleged witnesses have all been deemed inconclusive. None of this surprises Dr. J. Epping, a veterinarian. He believes that Corey, the diver who had a terrifying experience at the bottom of Lake Pepin while participating in a documentary film, was probably surprised by a very big fish. If I had to guess what Peppy the lake monster is, I'd have to say it's probably most likely something like a sturgeon or some big fish. Now, a lot of people are gonna be out on the water and see sturgeon, which you know can get seven feet long, up to 200 pounds. They see one of the, you know, they see a big fish like that cresting over the water. They're gonna say, oh my God, what is that thing? Gonna, it's probably a fish. There's usually always an explanation and it's not a monster. Whether it be a log, whether it be waves rolling over something or an optical illusion, it could be that. But you know, the most likely thing it would be, my guess would be it would be a sturgeon. Lake Pepin probably has about 50 or 60 different species of actually fish in there, um, let alone all the you know, avian species that are flying through with ducks and geese, swans. Um, but it, for the main, for the majority of it, there's a huge abundance of, you know, aquatic wildlife in Lake Pepin. And, and to go back a little further, when we were first viewing that image on the sonar, the, our, our depth finder, you can, you can judge approximate size by the blips, we call them, on those sonar. Well, this particular uh, image that we've seen on there, we were guessing anywhere from six to eight feet wide in like, you know, 26, 27 or so feet to roughly 35 feet long. It's huge. And I, I honestly believe that I was, I had an encounter with the Pepe monster. We know that there's huge, huge fish in the lake. There's been reported to be fish in the lake over 100 pounds, catfish over 100 pounds. And this could be perhaps cause for some confusion that perhaps the Pepe is, is, is just a huge fish. There have been sturgeon that have been taken out of the lake. There have been bull sharks that have been found in the lake. So we have all these species of animal and fish in the lake that maybe they're seeing that. Maybe people are misidentifying these creatures. And if you are swimming and a 10 foot, 120 pound sturgeon brushes by you, it's going to seem like a sea serpent to you. I guess it's a, the possibility exists that it could be a new fish species, but again, that would be highly unlikely given our Department of Natural Resources and the gill nets and the test nets that they do in all the river and lake systems in Minnesota. We're gonna notice that coming in, you know, because our DNR is constantly looking for invasive species that we have here, like the flying carp and zebra mussels and all that. So the amount of monitoring that we're doing, you know, of our waterways, if it's not gonna be a new fish, you know? And if there is, we're gonna know about it right away. Ancient legends, disturbing encounters, blurry images, but still no physical evidence of a monster living in Lake Pepin. So why do some people continue to believe? You know, as far as how many people believe or don't believe, uh, I don't know what that number would be. I would say that it's, as far as believers go, it's probably a pretty small number. 
of people who actually believe that there's something out there. My job involves traveling the world in search of folklore and legends, speaking with witnesses, digging through old historical archives, and then actually going to the places where these legends happen and trying to sort fact from fiction. The author of several books on unexplained phenomena, Chad led his own investigations on Lake Pepin in the summer of 2012. On both expeditions, we had a lot of equipment. We had sonar, underwater cameras, we had video, audio, we were fishing, we had nets, we used ourselves as bait in there swimming, and we came up with zero evidence of the monster. But what intrigued us is that when we were passing by people who were fishing, we would just call out and see if they had ever seen Pepe or if they had been on the lookout. And even though many of them did not have a sighting, what we were amazed at is many of these fishermen and women who we didn't even think would believe in a monster said they kept a camera with them just in case. In the absence of tangible evidence, photographs are often the only tools available to help unravel the mystery. I've seen several photos of, of what people believe are peppy. And sure, it looks like it could be a Loch Ness monster sort of creature, but you look at those things and you also say, you know what, that could be a log. You know, that's floating down the river at the, at the right time, the undulation that's there. You could have waves going over the top of something. So, yeah, I mean, can it look, you can make anything look like anything. I mean, I could take two hot dogs and stick them in the water and potentially make it look like a lake monster if I wanted. Sometimes the, the pictures we see, well, there's this newfangled thing called Photoshop. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, it's amazing the things that they can do with Photoshop these days. Now that didn't exist 30 years ago and there are these old photos out there that, uh, I don't know how you fake something that looks long and skinny swimming through the water, so. And then we also have to look at, you know, look at society right now. We're all running around with cell phones. We're all running around, you know, attached at the hip to our, you know, camera phones. If something like that's out there, we're gonna have really good photographic you know, evidence of that. Larry has developed a website for people to share their experiences and encounters with Pepe. The problem, according to some, is that the site also serves as a tool to promote tourism on Lake Pepin. Before the reward, um, there wasn't, there wasn't a repository for people to, to say, I have a sighting. You'd see something out on the lake and, and you didn't, there wasn't anything that you could do with it. Um, so that was part of why we created the website along with the reward is we assume now people are gonna say we saw something so now they have a place they can report it to and we can start being a library of, of those sightings. Local citizens commented, of course, like everything else, uh, you've got your naysayers or whatnot. You know, some people say, hey, Larry's trying to make a name for himself, but uh, having worked with Larry, he wanted to create a tourism draw to bring people in the region, because we have once they're here, it's a very beautiful area. I, go, I doubt that Pepe was created just to attract tourists. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a possibility that that, that Pepe was uh, remanufactured from from time from some time back. But I think in, there was initially there was there was a mystique or a mysterious mysterious creature or creatures in the lake. I think Larry uh, rejuvenated the monster, that these stories have been circulating for hundreds of years, but again, they were nearly forgotten, and Larry just simply dragged them out of the history books and made them relevant again. There is that segment of the population that says, oh, what are you doing? You just look like a bunch of goofballs, you know? But I have heard that there are people that come to Lake City because, hey, I heard this story about Pepe, so I wanted to come to Lake City and to see what it was all about and to go out and look at the lake. And um, So if, it's, if it drums off business in that regard, then, then it's doing its job, I guess. But I think Larry not only 
uh, benefits from tourists, but also he always makes the claim that there's no harm in promoting your history, that if you come here, whether or not you see Pepe in the lake, you're going to have a beautiful time and a wonderful area. So I think he's just promoting the town's unique history. a popular bar in a neighboring town of Lake City called Red Wing, also located on Lake Pepin. It's Pepe Porter, a dark beer with mysterious aromas, references the notorious legend of the lake monster. We have 13 varieties that we brew in our brew house. Our brew house is about uh, what we call a six barrel brew house, which means that we make about 186 gallons per week. We have several of our own styles that we serve, uh, ranging anywhere from a, a lighter ale to uh, a darker stout. All of our beers are meant to reflect something that's, that makes Red Wing what it is, and, and uh, the, the Lake Pepin area what it is. We try and, and promote stories that are unique to this region, and Pepe's Porter is, uh, is one of those stories. Porter beer, which is a uh, which we brew as an American porter, is a darker ale, and we decided to name it after the local lake monster. And there has been lore about Pepe the lake monster as long as anyone can remember. So there are newspaper clippings that you'll find from across the years, uh, uh, tales that have been told and then passed down uh, about Pepe the lake monster. Again, it all plays into the legend, and uh, you know, what is true and what isn't depends on the person that experienced it. As is the case for the vast majority of freshwater mythical monsters, the existence of Pepe has not been proven, but that hasn't stopped residents of Lake City from bringing Pepe to life outside of the lake. Yes, well, Lake City, you know, they promote it as a, a fun creature, the postcards and all the memorabilia. Pepe is a fun monster for most people in the community. The children in the community um, look for Pepe and laugh and giggle and talk about Pepe. Today, we portray him as a child-friendly monster. Uh, we tell children he's shy, that's why you never see him, because he's shy. And, uh, the t-shirts and sweatshirts that we carry are, are, are printed or embroidered by local businesses that do that kind of work. And then the little peppy uh, stuffed animals are made by a great-grandmother that lives right here in Lake City. Evelyn is a great-grandmother, and uh, she has the, the copyright uh, permission from Larry Nielsen to make these, and they're all made by hand. She buys the fabric and cuts it out and embroiders the eyes on and um, stuffs them. She said the stuffing is the hardest part. While the legend lives on in the streets of Lake City, research continues under the surface of the water. For Heidi and Corey, despite the technical challenges facing their investigation and with no offense intended to the many skeptics, hope springs eternal. After the expedition, I filmed some follow-up interviews with some of the other crew members, and the project is still in the works. I had to put it on the back burner for a while due to some other projects that came up. I believe that, my belief is that that fish or mammal in particular is a solo uh, all by itself, my belief. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is if there were more of them, I think you would see more sightings, there'd be more, more knowledge of them.
With the advent of Pepe, it put Lake City on map. Uh, we became, instead of a local attraction, we became a national and international attraction. According to Mr. Nielsen, he does get visitors uh, from well, various countries in Europe and from Asia that specifically come to this lake to find Pepe. Whenever there's a sighting of something like Pepe the Lake Monster, um, there's always a boom to you know any locality where that is, and and that's great for the town. Um, you know, do I think it's likely that there actually is a monster out there that exists? I don't think it's likely, but you know what? No one can say for certain because no one has found this thing washed up on shore. You know, no one has had it, you know, come up and take a breadcrumb out of your hand. And I'm certain there are people out there that truly believe they saw this. And if that's what they believe, great. And, and if other people want to come and take the chance, you know, in Lake City to try to see if they can find Pepe, great. Good for everyone involved. We know for a fact that people come to town just to see the, or hope for an opportunity or possibility to see the, the monster, Pepe. Uh, I believe, uh, overall, I'd say the community is embracing Pepe as, as our mascot. I think people, when we started talking about Pepe and offered, our tourism bureau offered the reward, it reminded people that Lake Pepin is a beautiful place to come and visit and that we were here. So it gave our town and our lake and our whole area some publicity. Well, I think the point of it being friendly today is it's more welcoming that it's more of a tourist draw. It's more fun, family friendly. You can go to Lake Pepin, you can do some water skiing, you can enjoy the beautiful surroundings and maybe catch this cute little animal as well. So we're in the process of working on something and knowing Mr. Nielsen will probably pick a, a peppy month or a peppy day. And, and if I was gonna pick a peppy day, I, it'll be that April day in 1871 when the two fishermen discovered him.